invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Paul's epistle to the Philippians. We'll be reading from, a, from Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 17, reading through the first verse of chapter 4. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 17. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the temple you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, help us to hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do what you call us to do. That we may be the people who you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to uh, break a rule I was told once by my friend and yours, Roy Barker. Roy said, a singer should never preach, and a preacher should never sing. Go ahead and do this. <laughs> you can join me to too, help, as, as my friend saying the black church, help the preacher. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Y'all do that? Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love. You got to hold on to it. Lifted me. You did pretty good. Thank you. Now, y'all have heard that song most of your life, right? I didn't hear that song until I was about 18 years old at Goodman Baptist Church. Miss Kay Clark, our music director, would lead that song. That was the first place I ever really heard those music, that kind of music, first place I ever really heard scripture read. I became a Christian at Goodman about 17 years ago. And I have to tell you, it wasn't because anything the interim preacher David Coggins preached it wasn't anything that a Sunday school teacher really said. It wasn't, frankly, it wasn't a fear of hell or a hope of heaven that made me become a Christian. What it was, was in this little church, which was a lot smaller than ours, but kind of similar. It was a store across the street. I think if EL had a hitching post, it's gone now, but we had one at the little store across the street. What it was, was these people knew who I was before I ever got there. Miss Frida, the, or Aunt Frida as I call her, the piano player had graduated high school with my dad, so I knew I was done. I knew she knew who I was. I knew she knew my family. She must have smelled the cigarette smoke on me when I came in to sit down on the front row with my best friend John wearing the Looney Tunes shirt. John likes to give me uh, uh, trouble about that even today, that, uh, that I would wear you know, Bugs Bunny and Tasmanian Devil t-shirts to church when I was a kid. Or about the one time I brought my offering to Miss Kelly's Sunday school class and what I thought was a really cool bag that looked like something from Robin Hood. It was a little velvet bag, a purple velvet bag with yellow strings. <laughs> if you're laughing, you know what it is. You got some explaining to do to the people who didn't laugh. I didn't know what it was. And so I brought my offering for Sunday school. Miss Kelly almost fell out of her chair. And little 10-year-old me in my little crown royal bag. <laughs> but those people loved me. They didn't care. They didn't care. I 
I can go back. Why am I doing this? Oh, I can go back now. Aunt Frida still plays the piano. I think she's leading the music now. And I'm a grown man in more ways than one. I have a wife and two kids. If I see Aunt Frida, she still puts a $20 bill in my front pocket. And I want to say, Aunt Frida, you retired. You need that money. But she still does. Ann Arrington played the organ, and every week I was in college, she would write me a little note. Sometimes there was good news in that note. So-and-so finally got saved, came down the aisle. We're going to baptize her. Sometimes it was news I didn't care to know. Rachel's having surgery. They're going to lance that thing on her leg. It swole up real big. <laughs> Sometimes it'd be about Frankie, her brother, and his mules. It didn't matter. Every week there was a card. I have those cards in a box somewhere. Now, I have to tell you, friends, I, there ain't much that that church would preach or teach that I would agree with much today, but those people loved me. They had what I think Paul was talking about to the church at Philippi when he talked about love. Paul is in prison when he writes this letter. Now, traditionally, we've always said he's in Rome, but there's evidence it could have been Ephesus, maybe Caesarea. But we know he's in prison, and we know that the church at Philippi is concerned about him, so they send a messenger to visit him in prison. And when that messenger arrives, he gets ill and sick, and Paul sends him back, and he sends him with this letter. He sends him because Paul says, I'm afraid this is going to wind it up for old Paul. He didn't say it that way. I'm afraid this is the end. I might, this might be the, the thing that gets me. And so when he writes to this beloved church, he says, continue and persevere in that selfless love of Christ for which you were known. And so Paul says to them and says to us now, as followers of Jesus Christ, we, we belong to a realm beyond our comprehension, a realm founded on the selfless love of God. And as such, Paul says, as followers of Jesus, we exemplify this citizenship, this belonging to another realm, by seeking to follow the example of Jesus. When I, shortly after becoming a Christian there at Goodman, I started sort of uh, having these friend groups of people my age who were part of our youth group and some others. We, we were uh, like our church, a rural church, but we had a lot of sort of uh, little youth gatherings with other churches. And my friend Jason started working at the only Christian bookstore in town. And we would go over and hang out. There was a little steel table in the back. We would all sit around and talk and, and listen to, you know, Jesus music. And I remember one day they had remodeled. It was called Dove. They remodeled it, and I'd gone in to visit my friend. And all along one wall were vanity plates. Don't you know what I'm talking about? Some had ichthuses, that's the Greek word for fish. It was a fish, the Jesus fish. Some had, you know, God is my co-pilot. Some of y'all probably have one of those. Um, there are some other ones that were up there, you know, crosses and different things. Some with, with Bible verses, but the text was so small you couldn't read them on the wall. I don't know how you read them on the bumper. But they were there. On the other side of the store were t-shirts and keychains and a whole little section for music in the back and those sorts of things. Jason lovingly referred to all this stuff as Jesus junk. He said, yeah, people come in here, buy all this Jesus junk, put it on their cars, wear it on their shirts, and then argue about the price of it. He said, I guess that's what they need to show the world they're Christians. But they didn't have Jesus junk in Philippi. Paul didn't have it. He just says to them, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me. Now, Paul doesn't say that to blow himself up, to say, I'm perfect, follow me, imitate me, do what I do. Paul's just saying, if you need to look somewhere, I hope it's me. I hope it's me. I hope as I follow Jesus, as I'm sitting here in prison. Now, do you want to imitate somebody who's in prison? Do you want to get a phone call tomorrow, blocked number, thinking, well, maybe, and you answer it, hey, it's your preacher, I'm down at the county jail, uh, remember, imitate me. Do you want to get that phone call? No. But Paul says it, imitate me. I'm here in prison. I'm here for my following of Jesus. Imitate me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. In other words, Paul says, I'm, in, I'm behind bars, but some of them are out there. 
And you know who they are. Don't you? Don't you? You know those people. You can list them right now. If I just started saying something, you'd start seeing their mind, their, their images in your brain. Some of them have gone on, but they're there. Some of them might be sitting right next to you. Some of them might be, I don't know, half a world away. Some might be buried over on the hill. But they're there. Paul says, observe those who live in a court. You know who they are. You don't need them to tell you. They don't have to have a tag on their car, a cross around their neck, a Bible under their arm. You know. And so Paul says, observe those. And then he says this really puzzling thing. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I've even often told you them. I tell you even now with tears. These who go around, whether it was the ultra-conservative Judaizers trying to get the Christians to do all the things they wanted to do, or whether it was those who were sort of like, well, Jesus was a nice teacher, but we don't have to listen. We can just do eat, eat, drink, and be merry. We're not sure who Paul was talking about. I think it's on purpose. Because I think Paul says, you don't draw a line and then pick a side. He says, their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. The self. Paul says, don't imitate them. Pay them no attention. But join in imitating me as I'm imitating Christ and others you know who are. The enemies of the cross, Paul says, are those who are living in the opposition of the very message of the cross. The self-emptying love of God. Which is what is at the heart of Paul's message to the Philippians. That the cross of Christ is about the self-emptying of God. And that these who were enemies of the cross, they live their lives in this contrary example. So don't follow theirs, Paul says. Live your life according to the example of Jesus. Now how do others know? How do others know if you're following the example of Jesus? Is it by a tag on the car? The jewelry we wear? The Bibles we tote? Or is it something more? For the other early Christians, I'm afraid the answer was much more grim. It was by the cross they carried. But Paul says, imitate me. As I imitate Christ. Because as followers of Jesus, we live with the expectation of Christ's return as that shaping reality for our lives here and now to live in that example. Now, how many of you, when you were growing up, maybe it was a summer, maybe it was a weekend, maybe you didn't, didn't, weren't in school yet or something, playing around at the house, roughhousing with a sibling, knock over something and break it. And what does Mama say? Wait until your daddy gets home. What? Did Roy not do that? Is that what I heard? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, wait till Eva gets home. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Wait till somebody gets home. How'd that make you, make you draw up, doesn't it? All of a sudden, not only will you fix what you broke, I'll take the garbage out. I don't care. I'll wash the dishes. We don't even have a dog, but I'll feed it. What do you want me to do? When you're in trouble, or when you think you're in trouble, what happens? That moment when Daddy or Eva comes home. <laughs> what happens? Boy, you, you, you ain't looking forward to that, are you? But what happens? What happens when you come home from school and you got all A's on your report card. Oh, you don't know? <laughs> all right, what happens um, when you come home and you got a few A's on your report card? I can't wait till Daddy gets home. I can't wait till he finds out how good. Man, when I, now, that wasn't my kid. When I was a kid, when I got my report card, we went to Paul's house, my mom's dad, Ma and Paul. Yeah, we were that country. Um, Paul, as I told some of you, looked just like old Jackie Gleason in a V-neck white T-shirt and suspenders and waxed his mustache. 
He'd sit at the end of the dining room table. We'd come in and, Paul, Paul, guess what? Guess what? I got all A's on my report card. Do you know why I was excited? Paul would pull his billfold out of his back pocket and give me a $10 bill. I got smart one year. He said, I'll give you a dollar for every A or $10 for all A's. I thought, man, there's more than 10 subjects. I should, y'all don't do the math on that. I should be getting more than $10 for all A's. But I'd be excited. Now, which way do you think folks live in the anticipation of Christ's return? Boy, I got something I can't wait for him to get here and show him. Or, my goodness, I'm going to be in so much trouble. What's Paul say? No. Our citizenship is in heaven, and it's from there we're expecting a Savior. Not fearing one. Not drawn up in the closet with the door shut and locked, hoping he doesn't find me. We're expecting him. We look forward to it. In 1 Thessalonians, the, the, the passage that's often twisted to talk about a rapture, Paul says that we will meet him in the air. That, that's this joy that's so great. We're going to go up as he's coming down. We can't wait for him to touch down on earth to bring the kingdom here. We're going to meet him in the air and come back down, Paul says. And here he says we're expecting it from there. For Paul and most of the early Christians, one of the primary motives of living this Christian life, of living out of this selfless love, was because you thought Jesus was going to come home for you punched out at work. Because you thought that it's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. That's why Paul says, look, if you can't get married, don't fool with it. You ain't going to have time to take gifts back to Target. Jesus is coming. Paul says, if you got to do, don't eat, if you make wine, don't bother, and then we don't do that, but don't bother with doing it, Paul says. It ain't going to be strong enough by the time Jesus gets back. Don't fool with doing anything that's going to take time because Jesus is coming back. And here Paul says, that's an expectant thing. We ought to be full of joy. But as the years go on and the years sort of crept by, this is what Paul writes second and what we don't have at third Thessalonians about. Uh Uh-oh, some folks are dying. What happens now? Paul says, either way, remember, Jesus says, I am coming back. It's not a time to be afraid. But boy, we ought to be like that kid with a report card. I can't wait for him to get here. I can't wait to show him what I did to make him proud. What I did for him. The early Christians, this is how they lived with that imminent return of Christ as their motivation for living as Jesus here and now. It was not a goal, not a finish line to cross. It was the driving motivation for living their lives in self-emptying, selfless love. So why don't we look forward to it that way? Why do we start doing it now? To look forward to it as, man, I can't wait for him to get here and show him, to show him what we've done. Because as followers of Jesus, this hope we have, this hope we have in selfless love is the thing that we stand firm upon, Paul says. That we stand firm on the selfless love of Jesus and its power to transform all of us, all the way. I was listening to one of my favorite thinkers, philosophers, theologians, an Irish guy, appropriately enough, on St. Patrick's Day. A guy named Pete Rollins. You've heard me mention his name before, probably. Pete one time was accused, and I may have told you this, accused of denying the resurrection by some of his critics. They said, we've read your books, Dr. Rollins. He has a Ph.D. in theology. We've read your books, and you deny the resurrection. And Pete said to them, yes. Yes. I deny the resurrection. Every time I fail to show love, I deny the resurrection. Every time I fail to do what Christ calls me to do, every time I fail to live into the full example of who Christ is for me and for everyone else, yes, I deny it. I deny the resurrection. And then he says, I pray there comes a day when I won't be able to deny it anymore. Paul says of Jesus when he comes again, he will transform the body of our humiliation. 
Paul sort of dancing on the edge of ancient Gnosticism here, but what he means is that when Christ comes again, that whatever the junk in us, in our way of knowing God, of, of denying the resurrection, will be burned away. It will be gone. This body will be transformed into what it's supposed to be. Pure love for God. That it may be conformed to the body of His glory, Paul says. How? Well, by the power that also enables Him to make all things subject to Himself. And then Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Stand firm in the Lord in this. That the motivating thing, the thing that drives us on, is always the self-emptying love of Christ. The lens through which we view the world is always the self-emptying love of Christ. The lens through which we view ourselves is the self-emptying love of Jesus Christ. And that love is the source of His power. The power that can transform us from everything we think is wrong with ourselves and everything anyone else may think is wrong with us into the whole, wonderful, glorified thing Christ calls us to be. Throughout this letter, Paul reminds the Philippians that above all else, stand firm in the example of Christ's selfless love. The love that has the power to presently, now, right now, in this moment, constantly, in every moment hereafter, and eternally transform us more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Because that's the point, right? To be more and more like Jesus. And we cannot do that on our own. Only by the self-emptying love of God. So as we continue on this Lenten journey, a journey we know where it's going, it's going to that place where the self-emptying reality of who God is is made all the more evident upon the cross at Calvary. May we be mindful of the nature of our faith, a faith that calls us to a life lived in the exemplary self-emptying love of Christ, calling us into the future, the promised future of His presence, into the transforming power of His unending, self-emptying love. May we be the people Christ calls us to be. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. We pray now, O Lord, that your Spirit be present among us, reminding us of the example you've set for us, reminding us also, Lord, that it is not just an example. God, it is who you are, one whose love for us is so deep and unending to the point of death, even death upon a cross. Lord, help us, help us now, Lord, to take hold of that promise as it changes us now and each breath we take forever. We pray in Christ's name, amen.